Section 17 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1. C. Segretti Cover-Up Segretti was first contacted by the FBI shortly after the Watergate break-in, when his name and phone number showed up on Howard Hunt's telephone records. Segretti immediately called Dwight Chapin at the White House to request his assistance in getting legal counsel. Chapin, after consulting with Gordon Strachan at the White House, told Segretti to return to Washington, D.C. immediately. Meanwhile, Strachan called John Dean and explained that the FBI had called a friend of his named Donald Segretti and wanted to interview him in connection with the break-in at the DNC. Strachan requested that Dean meet with Segretti. A meeting was arranged for the morning of Saturday, June 24, 1972, among Segretti, Strachan, and Dean in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel. Following a short discussion of Segretti's general activities, Dean told Segretti to come to Dean's office in the White House the following day for more detailed discussion. Segretti went to the executive office building the next day and outlined in detail to Dean his relationship with E. Howard Hunt. Dean told Segretti not to worry about the upcoming interview since the FBI had picked his name up on Hunt's phone records. In addition, Dean instructed Segretti not to divulge the names of Chapin, Strachan, or Kalmbach to the FBI unless the FBI felt it was absolutely necessary to have the names. Segretti left Washington and returned to California where he was interviewed by FBI agents. The interview focused on Segretti's contacts with E. Howard Hunt, and he was not forced to divulge any of the names about which he had been concerned. Segretti telephoned to John Dean after the interview to tell him that he had not been forced to reveal any of the sensitive names. In August 1972, Segretti was notified that he was being subpoenaed to appear before the grand jury investigating the Watergate break-in in Washington. Because of his concern about testifying before the grand jury, Segretti tried to contact his friends at the White House as well as local legal counsel. Segretti finally reached Dwight Chapin at the Republican convention. Chapin called Dean, who was also at the convention, to explain that Segretti was quite concerned about being called before the federal grand jury. Dean said that he would be happy to meet with Segretti in Florida since it was impossible for him to go to Washington at that time. After Dean talked to Chapin, he called Assistant Attorney General Henry Peterson at the Department of Justice and explained the sensitive problem that was confronting Segretti. Dean said he told Peterson that Segretti had no involvement in the Watergate incident, but that he met with Hunt in connection with some campaign activities that he had been performing for the White House. Dean testified he also explained to Peterson that Segretti was being paid by Kalmbach, and that he had been recruited by Chapin and Strachan. Dean said he stressed that if these facts were revealed, they would be quite embarrassing, and would cause political problems during the last weeks of the election. According to Dean, Peterson replied that he understood the problem and would see what he could do. Dean later spoke to Peterson again, and Dean testified that Peterson explained that he did not believe it would be necessary for the prosecutors to get into the specific areas of concern to Dean when Segretti appeared. Peterson recalls that the question of going into the dirty tricks of Segretti was also raised by Earl Silbert, who said that there did not appear to be a violation of the Corrupt Practices Act. The question was raised again by Charles Bowles, head of the accounting and fraud section of the FBI, who asked Peterson if there was any violation of federal election law by Segretti. Peterson replied that he knew of none. Peterson directed Silbert not to probe the relationships between Segretti and Kalmbach, Chapin, and Strachan because he didn't want him getting into the relationships between the president and his lawyer, or the fact that the president's lawyer might be involved in somewhat, I thought, illegitimate campaign activities on behalf of the president. Segretti flew to Florida a few days prior to his appearance before the grand jury. He met with John Dean briefly on the Saturday morning preceding the opening of the Republican National Convention. Dean explained to Segretti that he did not believe the government was particularly interested in pursuing the names of Strzok and Chapin and Kalmbach in connection with Segretti's activities, and that he doubted that Segretti would be asked any questions in these areas. Dean advised Segretti, however, that if he were asked any questions about his dirty tricks activities, he should answer every question truthfully, and if pressed, Dean advised Segretti to lay out the whole ball of wax. Segretti recalled that Dean was most concerned about Kalmbach's name being brought up, but that Dean mentioned that he might be able to put certain parameters in the grand jury examination through Henry Peterson. Segretti then traveled to Washington for his grand jury appearance. 
Prior to testifying, Segretti was interviewed by Earl Silbert and Don Campbell in the U.S. Attorney's Office. During the interview, he recalled that he was asked if he were getting paid by a Mr. K. However, once Segretti went before the grand jury, Segretti testified that Silbert did not get into that area of questioning. Segretti testified that a woman juror finally asked him who was paying him, and that he then testified that he was paid by Kalmbach and he was hired by Chapin and Strachan. Earl Silbert has filed an affidavit with the committee denying that the original Watergate prosecutors limited their questioning of Segretti in order to conceal the involvement of Chapin, Strachan, and Kalmbach. Silbert said that since Segretti's last payment was in March 1972, prior to the effective date of the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, it foreclosed the possibility of a violation of this act. Silbert also denied that he or Donald Campbell ever referred to Herbert Kalmbach as Mr. K. In his affidavit, Silbert explained more fully his questioning of Segretti. Because none of his non-Watergate activity appeared to involve criminal violations, and because the grand jury was investigating only Watergate, we did not examine Mr. Segretti at length about his political spying activities before the grand jury. However, we immediately requested the FBI to interview Messrs. Chapin and Strachan of the White House staff, who Mr. Segretti had informed us had recruited him, and Mr. Kalmbach in California. The reports of these interviews were sent to the Special Election Law Unit in the Department of Justice. The possible inference drawn by some that we did not explore Mr. Segretti's spying activities before the grand jury because we wanted to conceal any involvement of Messrs. Kalmbach, Chapin, and Strachan is nonsense. We did not because it did not relate to the break-in and the bugging. Following his grand jury testimony, Segretti called John Dean to explain that the names of Chapin, Strachan, and Kalmbach had been revealed by questioning from one of the grand jurors. Following his grand jury appearance, the FBI scheduled interviews with Chapin, Strachan, and Kalmbach. Dean had responsibility for preparing both Chapin and Strachan for their FBI interviews. Dean recalled that Strachan stated on one occasion in the presence of Richard Moore and Dean that he would perjure himself to prevent Haldeman from becoming involved in the matter. Strachan testified that the discussion with Moore and Dean concerned a reply to a press story in which Strachan offered to take responsibility for approving the hiring of Donald Segretti instead of Mr. Haldeman. After his grand jury appearance, Segretti's next contact concerning his activities in the re-election campaign was in the middle of September when he was contacted by Carl Bernstein and later by Robert Myers of the Washington Post, who called to ask about his activities. After receiving these calls, Segretti contacted Larry Young again for legal advice and also telephoned to Dwight Chapin. Both Chapin and Dean advised Segretti to keep a low profile, and Dean asked Segretti to call and check in periodically. On October 10, 1972, the Washington Post published the first allegations that Donald Segretti had organized a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of President Nixon's re-election and directed by officials at the White House and the Committee for the Re-election of the President. Segretti recalls being called by John Dean prior to the publication of the article, when Dean told Segretti of the forthcoming article. Dean said he was in Florida and that he was going to fly to Washington to meet Segretti as soon as possible to discuss the allegations in the article. Segretti immediately flew to Washington, D.C. and called Fred Fielding, Dean's assistant, after checking in at a local motel near the airport. Segretti was subsequently directed by Dean or Fielding to leave the motel, since he was registered under his real name, and to take a taxi to within a block of the executive office building where Fielding met him to take him into the executive office building. Segretti testified that he did not sign in on the entrance logs to the executive office building, since Fielding explained to the guard that this was the individual who lost his wallet, or something similar. Segretti met with Fielding and Dean for about an hour, and they discussed the allegations contained in the Washington Post article. Dean read the article to Segretti line by line, and they discussed the truth or falsity of each of the charges. At the end of the meeting, there was a brief discussion about Segretti writing a statement to be released publicly on the following day. After the meeting, Segretti said that Dean and Fielding drove him to a motel near Crystal City, where he registered under an assumed name. Segretti wrote out a brief statement the following morning for possible release by the White House. Segretti testified that Fielding came by his motel room at about 10 a.m. with a statement prepared by people in the White House that denied most of the allegations in the Post. Segretti said he read over Fielding's statement and made some corrections on it, since Fielding indicated they were under some time pressure to get the statement out. 
Later on that same day, Segretti was contacted again by Dean who explained that the media people in the White House had decided that the story would die by itself and that there should be no further statement made by the White House at that time. Segretti's proposed press statement was discussed in a meeting at Dwight Chapin's office that day attended by Ron Ziegler, John Ehrlichman, Dwight Chapin, John Dean, Gordon Strachan, and later by Fielding after he had received a draft copy of Segretti's proposed field statement. At that meeting, it was decided that Segretti should not issue his statement. Following the meeting, Dean testified that Ehrlichman directed him to advise Segretti to go incognito and hide from the press to avoid further stories until after the election. When Dean talked to Segretti later that afternoon, Dean mentioned how nice the Greek islands were at that time of year. There was also some discussion about how Segretti should travel back to the West Coast. Segretti recalled that Dean told him that it would be a great idea to take a train across the country. Segretti, following Dean's suggestion, then took trains from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia, from Philadelphia to Chicago, from Chicago to Houston, and from Houston to Nevada. During his travels, Segretti would periodically check in with Dean to learn the latest developments and revelations emerging from the White House and the campaign. Sometime during this same period, Segretti also called Doug Kelly and Robert Benz, his two major operatives in Florida, to inform them of his real identity so they would be prepared for the coming publicity. Following the election, Dean was asked by Haldeman and Ehrlichman to meet with Segretti to determine the extent of the involvement that Chapin and Strachan had with him. Soon thereafter, Dean met with Segretti in Palm Springs, California at the El Dorado Hotel, where Segretti had been staying for the week prior to the election. Dean taped his interview with Segretti, with the understanding that the material was privileged and would never be released. Segretti later claimed that the tape should not be disclosed because it was privileged by the attorney-client relationship. However, the committee directed Segretti to answer questions concerning his conversation with John Dean, since the facts did not support a bona fide attorney-client privilege. Dean testified that his visit to Palm Springs was interrupted by a request on November 11th from Todd Hullen that Dean go to Florida to meet with Ehrlichman and Haldeman, who were there with the president, to report on Dean's interview with Segretti. Dean flew to Florida immediately and met with Haldeman and Ehrlichman on about November 12th. At that meeting, Dean played the tape of the interview that he had with Segretti. While Dean was discussing the matter with Ehrlichman and Haldeman, Dean recalled that President Nixon requested that Haldeman meet with him in his office. Dean recalled that Haldeman sent a message back to the president that he was meeting with John Dean and that he would be over shortly to report to the president on the results of his meeting. On about November 15, 1972, Dean testified that he met with Haldeman and Ehrlichman at Camp David. During the first part of the meeting, the subject of Chapin remaining at the White House arose. Dean said he learned at that time that the president had decided that Chapin would have to leave the White House staff as a result of the information that had been given to Haldeman and Ehrlichman in Florida. Other officials in the White House, including Richard Moore, felt that the president should merely issue a letter of censure to Chapin and leave the matter alone. Dean raised this suggestion with Haldeman and Ehrlichman, but Ehrlichman felt it was not possible to raise the matter again with the president. Dean then was given the task of telling Chapin that he had to leave the White House. Meanwhile, Dean was directed by Ehrlichman to get a job for Segretti, and so he relayed this request to Herb Kambach. Kalmbach apparently found a job for Segretti, which paid about $30,000 a year at the Holiday Inn in Montego Bay, Jamaica, in a legal public relations capacity. Segretti said he was quite interested by the prospect of this high-paying job, but testified that since his mother was sick and since he received a subpoena from the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Administrative Practices and Procedures at about the same time, he decided not to take the job. Dean also discovered that the owner of the Holiday Inn where Segretti was going to work was a friend of President Nixon, and so Dean said he instructed Segretti not to take the job. At about this time, Dean spoke with Paul O'Brien, counsel for CRP, about possible West Coast counsel for Segretti. O'Brien recommended Gordon Hampton, an old friend of his from Los Angeles. Segretti met with Hampton and wrote out in longhand all the details of his activities during the previous year. Hampton subsequently gave this statement, as well as Segretti's phone bills, address cards, and account book to Paul O'Brien to transmit to John Dean on December 8, 1972. Hampton said he sent this material to Dean, even though Dean had never requested it, because he felt that Dean was acting as co-counsel on the case. These materials were subsequently turned over to the select committee by John Dean pursuant to his subpoena Ducas Tecum. 
After Segretti was subpoenaed by the Senate Subcommittee on Administrative Practices and Procedures, he retained John Pollock, a Los Angeles trial attorney. Pollock said that Hampton told him that Pollock's name had been submitted to or screened by or approved by the White House. During the period that Hampton and Pollock represented Segretti, O'Brien kept in touch with them and reported all of their activities to John Dean. There is no evidence that Hampton or Pollock received any directions from third parties on how to represent their client Donald Segretti. D. White House Press Response On October 10, 1972, the Washington Post published the first allegation that the Watergate bugging incident stemmed from a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of President Nixon's re-election and directed by officials at the White House and the Committee for the Re-election of the President. In addition, the Post alleged that Donald Segretti traveled around the country recruiting agents to sabotage opposing campaigns and to gather intelligence information on opponents. These revelations by the Washington Post initiated a concerted and organized effort by the White House and the Committee to re-elect the President to deceive, mislead, and misinform both the public and the press as to the activities of Donald Segretti and his agents. First, as described above, Segretti was immediately called back to Washington and then instructed to lay low until after the election in November. In the daily press briefing at the White House on October 10th, following the publication of the story about Segretti in the Washington Post, White House Press Secretary Ron Ziegler refused to provide any details or further information at all to press inquiries concerning the Segretti matter and other information revealed by the Washington Post. On October 13, 1972, the White House press office was contacted by Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein of the Washington Post, who said that they would report on Sunday that Dwight Chapin was a White House contact over Donald Segretti, that Segretti was paid a $20,000 annual salary from a trust account in the lawyer's name, a high-placed friend of the president, that Segretti received some assignments from E. Howard Hunt, and that Segretti reported frequently to Chapin on the progress of the sabotage activities. Despite the fact that Segretti had flown to Washington, D.C. on October 10th to explain exactly what he had done, and despite the knowledge of Strachan and Chapin about the details of Segretti's hiring, the White House issued the following statement. Statement by Dwight Chapin As the Washington Post reporter has described it, the story is based entirely on hearsay and is fundamentally inaccurate. For example, I do not know, have never met, seen, or talked to E. Howard Hunt. I have known Donald Segretti since college days, but I did not meet with him in Florida, as the story suggests, and I certainly have never discussed with him any phase of the grand jury proceedings in the Watergate case. Beyond that, I don't propose to have any further comment. After the Post published the story on October 15, 1972, a meeting was held in the Roosevelt Room of the White House among Ehrlichman, Ziegler, Buchanan, Richard Moore, Dwight Chapin, and John Dean. The purpose of this meeting was to prepare Ziegler for his press briefing the following day with reference to the Segretti stories in the paper. A secretary was present during the meeting and recorded much of the hypothetical questioning and answering of Mr. Ziegler by those present. The instructions given to Ziegler on October 15, 1972, and throughout the rest of the presidential campaign were designed to withhold information from the public about Segretti's activities, so that the president's chances for re-election would not be affected. Ziegler's basic response was, Gentlemen, I have nothing to add to what Chapin has already said on the subject. Judging from what Chapin had already said on the subject, Ziegler's response to such press inquiries was hardly forthcoming. Notes from the meeting indicate that it was known October 15th that Herbert Kalmbach paid Segretti for his expenses and salary during his employment. And yet, when the White House was informed by the Washington Post on October 15, 1972, that a story stating that Kalmbach had authorized payments to Donald Segretti would appear the following day, the White House had no comment. At the 8.15 a.m. meeting in the White House on Monday, October 16, 1972, it was decided that Ron Ziegler, RNC Chairman Robert Dole, and Clark McGregor should all make statements attacking the Post stories of the previous days. Ziegler characterized the charges in the Washington Post as malicious, and stated that he would neither discuss nor deny the charges because to do so would dignify them. During the day, McGregor was advised that both Ziegler and Dole had made strong statements, and so he thought there was no longer a need for him to make a statement. However, McGregor testified that John Ehrlichman called him and asked him to read a statement that had been prepared. McGregor testified that he did not know the author of the statement, and that he opposed merely reading the statement to the press and then refusing to answer any questions. 
McGregor also testified that he had no knowledge that the CRP or the White House were supporting any type of political espionage. However, McGregor had talked to Dwight Chapin prior to his press conference on October 16th and had been informed that Segretti had been hired by Chapin to perform pranks during the campaign. Nevertheless, McGregor read the prepared statement on the afternoon of October 16, 1972, which said, in part, Using innuendo, third-person hearsay, unsubstantiated charges, anonymous sources, huge scare headlines, the Post has maliciously sought to give the appearance of a direct connection between the White House and the Watergate, a charge which the Post knows, and half a dozen investigations have found, to be false. The hallmark of the Post's campaign is hypocrisy, and its celebrated double standard is today visible for all to see. It is said that this is a dirty campaign, but all the dirt is being thrown by only one side. The mudslinging, the name-calling, the unsubstantiated charges, the innuendos, the guilt by association, the character assassination, the second-hand hearsay, are all tactics exclusively employed by the McGovernites and their apologists. President Nixon will remain on the high road, discussing issues of real concern to the American people in a fair, forthright, and hard-hitting manner. On October 25, 1972, the Washington Post reported that H. R. Haldeman was one of five individuals who had authority to approve payments from a secret cash fund during the 1972 campaign. While this article did not relate specifically to Segretti, it was published in the same time frame as the earlier Segretti articles. Again, the White House issued only a terse statement to the Post which said, Your inquiry is based on misinformation because the reference to Bob Haldeman is untrue. Neither Haldeman nor General L. Warren, Deputy White House Press Secretary, would elaborate any further on the story. Once again, Ron Ziegler labeled the story untrue and accused the Washington Post of shabby journalism and a blatant effort at character assassination. Clark McGregor joined Ron Ziegler in issuing a flat, official denial of the Washington Post story. Subsequent testimony before this committee revealed that Haldeman authorized the hiring of Segretti and authorized payments from the cash fund kept by Herbert W. Kambach. On November 1st, Dwight Chapin drafted a proposed statement to be released by the White House which briefly related some details of the hiring of Segretti. Four days later, Chapin drafted a memorandum for John Dean which was marked Eyes Only. This memo was entitled Chronology of Activity and outlined for Dean some of the facts concerning Segretti's hiring by Chapin and Strachan. The purpose of the operation, according to Chapin, was that we were after information as to the schedules of candidates, people who could infiltrate headquarters, could ask embarrassing questions, and could organize counter-demonstrations to those we expected our opposition to come forth with during the campaign. The memo also noted that in January or February 1972, after Gordon Liddy reported to Gordon Strachan that there was an unidentified agent in the field who was causing some problems for the CRP, Strachan checked two people, blank and blank, and then Don was advised to report to Liddy. The two individuals, whose names were left blank, were Haldeman and Mitchell. Following the election, Dean testified that Haldeman asked him to write a report for public release that would include full disclosure of the Segretti matter. Taking the information provided by Chapin, Segretti, and others, Dean drafted a series of carefully worded affidavits for each individual whose name had been mentioned by the press in relation to political sabotage and espionage activities. Based on the affidavits, Dean, with the help of Richard Moore, wrote a summary draft report and attached the affidavits. This report was forwarded to Haldeman on December 5, 1972. Haldeman gave the report to Ehrlichman, who made some penciled changes, and then forwarded it to Ron Ziegler. On December 13, a meeting was held in Ziegler's office among Ziegler, Haldeman, Dean, and Moore to discuss whether or not to release the information. Richard Moore, John Dean, and Dwight Chapin all testified that Chapin had been in favor from the start of releasing a brief statement whereby Chapin would accept responsibility for the hiring of Segretti and would apologize for having done so. However, at the meeting on December 13th, Dean's proposed releases were discussed, and in the words of Richard Moore, John Dean's memos just raised more questions than they asked. It was not a complete statement, it wouldn't have been a proper one to put out, and I think I probably said, it wasn't justified and it was just shelved. Dean recalled that nothing was resolved at the meeting, and that it was the consensus of the group that the White House should continue to do nothing on the general theory that no one would be arrested for what they didn't say. End of section 17.
Section 18 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1. 2. Other Intelligence Gathering and Disruption. Although the activities of Segretti and his associates were the most widespread of the White House and CRP-sponsored covert campaign activities, there were other significant inappropriate activities during the 1972 campaign. They are summarized below. Ruby won. As noted elsewhere in this report, Senator Muskie was considered the leading Democratic contender and a potentially significant threat to President Nixon's re-election until his setbacks in the spring 1972 primaries. Trying to obtain information on his campaign activities was a high priority of those planning the re-election campaign. An early example of a covert operation aimed at Muskie was the Ruby One Project, which involved planting someone in the Muskie campaign. The plan was developed by Jeb Magruder with the help of Ken Reitz beginning in August 1971. Magruder asked Reitz if he could arrange to plant someone in the Muskie campaign who would be responsible for obtaining as much information concerning the campaign as possible, including intra-office memos, speeches, travel schedules, press releases, and position papers. According to Reitz, Magruder assured him that such an operation was legal. Reitz told Magruder that he would confer with a friend on establishing a workable plan. After this conversation with Magruder, Reitz contacted John Buckley, who was director of the Inspection Division at the Office of Economic Opportunity, OEO, and asked Buckley to help him place a volunteer in the Muskie headquarters who would channel information to CRP. Buckley agreed to help. In late September 1971, Buckley told Reitz that he had drawn up a plan inspired by a newspaper column telling of a free taxi ride offered to Senator Humphrey to have a cab driver offer his services to the Muskie organization. Buckley told Reitz he had already secured a cab driver for the job, and Reitz approved the plan. Buckley had selected Elmer Wyatt, an old acquaintance of his, for the job. Buckley instructed Wyatt to go to Muskie headquarters and offer his services as a volunteer. Wyatt understood that he would be paid, although he and Buckley did not talk finances at their first meeting. Reitz said that Magruder later approved payment of $1,000 per month. Wyatt went to the Muskie headquarters where he first worked as a volunteer, doing errands such as picking up dry cleaning and mailing campaign literature to other Muskie offices. Eventually, however, Wyatt was asked to deliver inter-office mail between Muskie's Senate office and his campaign headquarters. Wyatt kept Buckley informed on his progress as a Muskie volunteer, and Buckley in turn reported to Reitz that Wyatt was established as a volunteer at the Muskie headquarters. From September 1971 until April 1972, Buckley worked with Wyatt in obtaining and photographing confidential documents from the Muskie campaign during the time Buckley was working at OEO. In the early stages, Wyatt would call Buckley before leaving to deliver documents either to or from Muskie's Senate office. Wyatt would then pick up Buckley on a specified corner, and while riding in Wyatt's cab, Buckley would review and photograph pertinent documents. When this operation was completed, the material was delivered to the Muskie campaign headquarters or Senate office. This procedure of taking pictures in the back seat was unsatisfactory for Buckley, and so he rented office space at 1026 17th Street Northwest in Washington. Buckley also purchased new equipment which was more effective in photographic documents. Wyatt obtained press releases, itineraries, internal memoranda, drafts of speeches and position papers, and brought them regularly to Buckley's rented office to be photographed by Buckley during his lunch hour. Buckley testified that no mail was ever opened. After developing the film, Buckley turned it over to Reitz during meetings on various corners of Pennsylvania Avenue. Reitz, in turn, gave the film to Magruder. In November 1971, Magruder gave Herbert Porter some developed 35mm film and a viewer and asked him to review the film without offering any explanation of its origin. Porter stated that Magruder occasionally asked him for the film and viewer to show them to Mitchell. Porter recalled that later Reitz brought the film directly to Porter at Magruder's instructions. Porter's job was to review the film and bring anything of interest to Magruder's attention. On occasion, Martha Duncan, Porter's secretary, typed transcripts based upon the photographed documents for forwarding to Magruder. At Magruder's request, Porter testified he also sent copies of the transcripts to Strachan. 
In December 1971, Porter sent a transcript of one of the filmed documents from Muskie headquarters to Magruder. It was a staff memorandum from Muskie's campaign manager suggesting that Muskie, as chairman of a subcommittee on government operations, could get good coverage if he held tax hearings of his committee in California. Magruder asked Porter to have the transcript retyped on plain bond stationery and sent to Evans and Novak. Porter did so. Evans and Novak printed it, and the hearings were never held. On another occasion, Porter told Magruder he had a 20-page speech that Muskie was planning to deliver against the nomination of William Rehnquist to the Supreme Court. According to Porter, Magruder told him to have a transcript typed from the filmed document because Mitchell wanted to see it. The floor plan of Muskie's headquarters was also obtained through this political intelligence operation. In December 1971, Gordon Liddy began working at the committee to re-elect the president, and so Magruder instructed Porter to give the film and viewer to Liddy. At about the same time, Howard Hunt took over Reese's job of obtaining the film from Buckley. At Liddy's request, Hunt met Buckley on various corners of Pennsylvania Avenue as Reitz had done previously. During these brief meetings, Hunt used the alias Ed Warren, and Buckley used the alias Jack Kent. Throughout their association, Hunt never knew Buckley's real name. Although Hunt was then employed by the Robert R. Mullen Company, he was also working closely with Gordon Liddy, who was responsible for the political intelligence gathering capabilities at CRP. The code name Ruby One evolved as part of the overall Gemstone plan, and was used primarily by Liddy and Hunt when referring to Wyatt. They also referred to John Buckley, alias Jack Kent, as Fat Jack. Hunt met with Buckley approximately 12 to 15 times. Buckley turned over film to Hunt, who then gave it over to Liddy. Hunt also gave Buckley plain envelopes containing cash on occasion to cover Buckley's expenses. This procedure continued until April 1972, when it was decided that Muskie was no longer a viable candidate and the operation was terminated. The Ruby One operation, as Hunt and Liddy referred to it, lasted approximately eight months and cost about $8,000. Buckley testified that he and Wyatt did not participate in any other political intelligence operations for CRP. B. Sedan Chair One the genesis of sedan chair, according to Bart Porter, was Jeb Magruder's concern with the favorable publicity the Democrats received during past campaigns from the humor generated by Democratic prankster Dick Tuck and those like him who were making Republicans the objects of their pranks. In an effort to get similar headlines, Magruder instructed Porter to obtain advanced schedules for leading Democratic contenders as part of a plan to carry out disruptive activities. The first operation arranged by Porter involved a musky visit to Chicago. An unidentified associate of Porter's organized a crowd carrying Nixon signs to meet musky at the Chicago airport, a move that generated some news in the local papers. Similar events took place in Cincinnati and Columbus, Ohio, and in cities in New Jersey. According to Porter, the efforts were unsuccessful, eliciting in the media little favorable Republican publicity. Occasionally, Porter paid his field operatives small amounts of money, which he received from Hank Buchanan, the accountant at CRP. In the early stages, he stated that he never distributed more than $100 or $200 to any individual. In conjunction with these efforts, Porter went to Ron Walker, then the president's chief advance man, and asked Walker if he had any associates who might be proficient at dirty tricks. Walker recommended Roger Greaves, a friend of his, and shortly thereafter Greaves, Porter, and Magruder met in California. Following the meeting, Greaves was retained and given the code name Sedan Chair, a reference to an old Marine Corps operation that Porter remembered. It was Porter's understanding that Magruder wanted someone to follow or precede Democratic candidates and cause general harassment. For example, Porter said that Magruder envisioned an individual who would rob motorcades of automobile keys, schedule fake meetings, or steal shoes of the opposition workers that were left in hotel halls to be polished. Greaves was told that he would be reimbursed for expenses and that Porter would be the CRP contact. 
he was told that if successful in early forays he would be hired on a long-term basis. Greaves' recollection of the meeting with Porter and Magruder is that Magruder wanted someone to filter stories to the media, to gather information from the opposition, and to cause harassment. Magruder, according to Greaves, stressed the need for performing his tasks covertly. Greaves said he was told by Porter that he should terminate the job he then had and that cover employment would be arranged with a large corporation, which would pay Greaves' salary for work performed at Porter's direction. According to Porter, Greaves at first expressed reservations about taking the job, but agreed with Magruder's suggestion that he perform some pranks in California on a trial basis. On November 17, 1971, confidential memo from Porter to Magruder concerning the operation reads as follows. Things went well in Los Angeles with our friend. I would like the green light to proceed with the second part of the plan. This will involve finding him a suitable home. He is ready, willing, and most able. Any ideas? Porter stated that the suitable home, referred to above, was finding a corporation to pay Greaves' salary while he covertly worked for CRP. In addition, the date of the memo above indicates that it was written after some of Greaves' early successful activities described below. Shortly after the meeting in California, Greaves received a call from Porter who relayed Muskie's schedule and instructed Greaves to arrange for pickets at a Muskie appearance. Blacks and hippies were preferred as pickets by Porter according to Greaves. Porter asked Greaves to place Nixon signs at the airport arrival of Senator Muskie and to place anti-Muskie signs at a dinner at which the candidate was scheduled to speak. On another occasion, Porter said that Magruder told him to have Greaves place some signs at the Muskie rally at Whittier College and perhaps get media coverage. This rally was the same occasion when Chapin instructed Segretti to arrange for pickets. According to Porter, money was sent to Greaves on three occasions. On the first occasion, Greaves claimed he needed $300 immediately for pickets who were to appear at the Muskie appearance at Whittier College. The second instance occurred when earlier Magruder or Ken Kachigian asked Porter to send Greaves 25 copies of the anti-Muskie pamphlet ostensibly put out by the citizens for a liberal alternative. A musky fundraising dinner was planned in Beverly Hills, and Kachigian or Magruder thought it would be humorous to place a copy of the pamphlet in each of the menus, according to Porter. However, because the dinner never occurred, Senator Muskie was apparently ill, this stunt was sidetracked. The third time Porter forwarded money to Greaves was in January 1972, when Greaves finally decided to join the re-election campaign as a political prankster. Porter testified that Magruder told him he needed someone to work full-time on political pranks in January 1972. It was Porter's impression that Magruder was under pressure to make immediate arrangements for someone to go on to New Hampshire and then to Florida to perform pranks and familiarize himself with the Muskie campaign. Porter contacted Greaves and instructed him to use his imagination in performing political pranks that would get good coverage in New Hampshire. A salary of $2,000 per month was agreed upon. Before Greaves commenced his activities, he had his picture taken by Porter. This was done at the request of Gordon Liddy, who explained to Porter that some of his underlings would be doing some rough work in New Hampshire and he wanted to avoid injuring Greaves. By all accounts, Greaves' performance in New Hampshire was a dismal failure. Greaves often did nothing more than visit bars and listen to conversations about the Muskie campaign. Porter has testified that Greaves said he arranged calls to voters in the middle of the night with the caller falsely stating that they were Harlemites for Muskie, requesting the voters' support for Muskie. In his interview with the select committee staff, Greaves flatly denied any involvement in this episode. Greaves spent some time in New Hampshire and then went to Florida, where he again was supposed to organize activities disruptive to Muskie's campaign. Greaves stayed in Florida only a few days before returning to California. The next time Porter heard from Greaves was when Greaves called and said he had returned to California and was resigning for personal reasons. C. Sedan Chair 2 Following Greaves' departure, Magruder told Porter he needed another operative in the field to gather information about various Democratic candidates. Magruder said he was directed to place another individual in the opposition campaign by John Mitchell. 
Magruder stated that this person was to provide information only and was not to engage in any disruptive activities. Porter instructed Roger Stone, a young scheduler in his office, to make arrangements for someone who would work in two or three of the primary campaigns as kind of in eyes and ears. Roger Stone's recollection of the original Sedan Chair 2 discussions conflicts with the testimony of Magruder and Porter. Stone recalled discussing the need with Porter for an individual who would perform political pranks as well as gather useful information concerning opposition campaigns. Stone said he discussed the need for a clever field man with Morton Blackwell, who recommended Michael W. McMinoway of Louisville, Kentucky. After introductory telephone conversations with McMinoway, Stone flew to Louisville, and using the assumed name of Jason Rayner, Stone explained to McMinoway that he was being recruited to work in the presidential primary states and track and infiltrate the Democratic organizations. The two agreed that McMinoway would receive $1,500 a month for his services, and that after Rayner designated which Democratic organizations were to be infiltrated, the actual operation procedures would be left up to McMinoway. At this first meeting and throughout McMinoway's tenor, efforts were made to conceal CRP's involvement in the undertaking. Stone told McMinoway only that he was working for a group of concerned citizens that were interested in the outcome of the 1972 presidential election. McMinoway was supplied with a post office box in Washington to which he was to send information, thereby avoiding any contact with CRP or its officials. McMinoway was subsequently given instructions by Stone, who said he received them from Porter, who said he obtained them from Magruder. Magruder received most of his instructions from John Mitchell. In his testimony before the Select Committee, McMinoway described how he infiltrated a Democratic candidate's campaign. The usual procedure was to start off as a volunteer worker in the particular organization from which I wished to gather information. Hard work and seemingly helpful efforts on behalf of a particular candidate advanced McMinoway in the organizations. My objective, McMinoway testified, was to work within an organization to gain their confidence, and to therefore be able to be in a position where I could personally observe and find out the information that I felt important to the organization and its structure. Occasionally, McMinoway worked simultaneously for two or three Democratic candidates. After obtaining relevant information from the campaign organizations, McMinoway called Stone or transmitted the materials to Stone via the Washington Post Office box. Stone, in turn, passed the information he received on to Bart Porter. Porter gave the information to Magruder and Bob Reisner, his assistant, in the form of memos typed on blank paper, beginning, The Confidential Source Reports. Magruder said that he sent this information on to John Mitchell and to Gordon Strachan for H.R. Haldeman. Finally, Strachan testified that he included information from Sedan Chair 2 in his Political Matters Memoranda for H.R. Haldeman. He specifically recalled including the report on the Pennsylvania Humphrey campaign discussed below. In addition to this information gathering function, McMinoway occasionally engaged in disruptive activities which affected particular Democratic campaigns. McMinoway's first assignment from Stone and the chain of command above him was to go to Washington in March 1972 and infiltrate the Muskie headquarters. Stone instructed McMinoway to obtain information about Muskie staff members campaign finances, schedules of events, and any other useful information. McMinoway's diary corroborated his success in gathering information in Wisconsin. Other activities of McMinoway in Wisconsin were intended to disrupt Democratic candidates. On March 28, 1972, instead of supervising the distribution of musky literature, his diary shows that McMinoway talked his group of workers into drinking beer. On March 30th, he visited the Humphrey headquarters and gave them a schedule of events of the Muskie campaign. On March 25th, while still ostensibly a Muskie worker, McMinoway visited McGovern's headquarters and talked to a worker there about possible disruptions of a Muskie television interview. Finally, on March 31st, the diary shows that he went down to headquarters and diverted some Election Day precinct materials. Following the Wisconsin primary, Stone, acting on orders from Porter, told McMinoway to infiltrate the Pennsylvania Humphrey campaign. Using an alias, McMinoway presented himself as a volunteer and was welcomed to the campaign. 
he routinely began sending relevant information about the campaign to Washington. The Humphrey campaign also asked McMinoway to help supervise their phone bank operations. In this capacity, he promptly put people on the night shift on calling and duplicating cards that had been done by the day shift. In addition, he rearranged names to be called so that the night shift would make the small calls as the day shift. The impact of this action was noted in his diary. Repetition of calls is starting to aggravate the volunteer block captains. The captains are getting called two or three times and it is beginning to bother them. Some captains have already quit because of the repeated calls. At one point, McMinoway wrote in his diary that he hired people of low caliber qualifications to work the phone banks. On another occasion, he rearranged stacks of names to be called so that prepared messages to be read by the caller were directed to the wrong group. Calls for black voters were substituted for calls to union members and vice versa. On still another occasion, McMinoway falsely told volunteers who were scheduled to work the phone banks that they would not be needed that particular day. McMinoway testified that his phone bank activities caused considerable disruption to the Humphrey campaign because, as he wrote in his diary, Humphrey is spending one-third of his budget on the phone bank and literature packets that the block captains will distribute. As in Wisconsin, McMinoway's loyalties were not confined to the Democratic candidate he had volunteered to assist. In an April 22, 1972 entry in his diary, he shows he called people from the Humphrey headquarters and urged them to vote for Senator Jackson. McMinoway testified that he impressed the Humphrey people with his willingness to work. Toward the end of the Pennsylvania campaign, McMinoway testified that a national coordinator asked him to work at the Humphrey Los Angeles headquarters in the California primary. In his diary, McMinoway quoted from an alleged letter that the national coordinator prepared to introduce him in California. The letter said McMinoway was an avid Humphrey supporter that could be trusted in any project. McMinoway was then assigned by Stone and his superiors to go to California and infiltrate both the McGovern and Humphrey campaigns. This assignment came after the mid-April 1972 meeting when Gordon Strachan testified that H.R. Haldeman told him to tell G. Gordon Liddy to transfer whatever possible capability he had from Muskie to McGovern. McMinoway testified that he engaged in the same activities in California as he had in prior primaries, and that he reported by telephone to Stone daily. McMinoway testified that he learned of the Watergate break-in after the California primary, while awaiting his next assignment. McMinoway said he immediately called Stone, only to learn that his number had been disconnected that same morning. About two days later, McMinoway said that Stone called him and asked that he continue his activities, explaining that Stone had taken no part in any illegal actions. McMinoway said he remained unconvinced, but that he agreed to go to Washington to meet with Stone's supervisor to receive reassurance of the propriety of his undertaking. In Washington, McMinoway testified he received a phone call in his hotel room. The man identified himself merely as Mr. M, just for the matter of having something a reference for me to contact and he reassured me that the organization I was working with was not involved in illegal activities and quite strenuously passed on to me the fact that they were not, in fact, connected with the people that were apprehended. This mysterious caller was Bart Porter, who stated that he had discussions with McMinoway after the June 17 break-in. Porter had no recollection of any discussion about the break-in, recalling that the conversation focused on a possible increase in salary for sedan chair too. McMinoway testified that after this convention, he volunteered for work at McGovern's national headquarters in Washington, where he worked closely with McGovern's administrative staff. As he explained, by this time I had become a familiar face. At the Democratic National Convention, McMinoway claimed to achieve new successes in his efforts to infiltrate the opposition. The first five days there, he said, were used to amass information on where different delegations were staying, where different hotels were, the locations, and so forth. Thereafter, McMinoway served as a member of the security staff in McGovern's headquarters at the Doral Hotel, a position which, he testified, occasionally allowed him access to otherwise private areas. As he explained in his diary, Mc McMinoway said he was a guard on the penthouse floor where McGovern was staying. McMinoway also wrote in his diary that he had access to all of McGovern's convention operation rooms, and that he met all of the big-time McGovern staff. McMinoway wrote that he watched television with Senator McGovern on the night of the vote, 
on the challenge to the California delegation, and added, It is amazing how easy it would be to be right in the midst of all the operations and planning and yet be an enemy. Many of McMinoway's particular claims about his work at the Democratic conventions are contradicted by sworn affidavits and testimony in the public committee record. However, there is no question that McMinoway was able to secure a position as a volunteer security guard of the McGovern floors while working directly for the committee to re-elect the president. D. Ruby II In February 1972, Howard Hunt hired Thomas Gregory, a student at Brigham Young University, to infiltrate the Muskie campaign. Hunt met Gregory through Robert Fletcher the nephew of Robert Bennett, Hunt's employer at the Mullen Company. Using the alias Ed Warren, Hunt called Gregory in Utah and asked him to come to Washington for an expense-paid job interview. About a week later, Hunt and Gregory met at the Park Central Hotel in Washington, where Hunt explained that he wanted information from the Muskie campaign, including schedules, internal memorandums, and general observations of the campaign. Gregory was to work as a volunteer for Muskie, report to Hunt once a week, and receive $175 a week for his services. Gregory accepted the offer. The next day, Gregory began working as a volunteer at the Muskie campaign headquarters, where he was placed in the foreign affairs section under Anthony Lake. His job consisted of photocopying, picking up schedules, and other random chores. Gregory did not photocopy any material for Hunt but he did type reports based upon documents he read or conversations he overheard. Hunt and Gregory met weekly in a drugstore at 17th and K Streets Northwest in Washington, D.C. During these brief meetings, Gregory gave Hunt typed reports on the week's activities. When Hunt was not available, Gregory gave this material to Robert Fletcher to pass on to Hunt. All information that Hunt received from Gregory was turned over to Gordon Liddy, including the memorandums that Hunt typed which summarized Gregory's oral reports. Hunt did not retain any copies of this material. Gordon struck and testified that in mid-April 1972, Haldeman told him to contact G. Gordon Liddy to tell him to transfer his capability from Muskie to McGovern with particular interest in discovering what the connection between McGovern and Senator Kennedy was. Strucken also testified that he assumed, finally, there was going to be one unified system of intelligence gathering under Liddy after this conversation. At about this same time, Hunt asked Gregory to transfer to the McGovern campaign as a volunteer, which he did. Gregory's responsibilities remained the same as in the Muskie campaign, with one significant addition. He was now to prepare and assist Hunt and Liddy in their plans to place electronic surveillance on McGovern headquarters. Gregory gave Hunt a floor plan and office description of the McGovern headquarters at Hunt's request. Hunt then introduced Gregory to James McCord in late April or early May 1972. In a meeting at the Roger Smith Hotel, Washington, D.C., Hunt and McCord told Gregory they were planning to place a bug in the McGovern headquarters and would need assistance. In late May 1972, Gregory took McCord through the McGovern headquarters to familiarize McCord with the physical layout. On a second occasion, May 27, 1972, Gregory again took McCord through the McGovern headquarters. On that visit, McCord unsuccessfully attempted to plant a bug in Frank Mankiewicz's office. Sometime in late May or early June 1972, Gregory met Gordon Liddy for the first time, during an automobile ride in which Hunt drove Liddy and Gregory around the McGovern headquarters while Liddy told Gregory that he, too, was interested in getting into the McGovern offices. Hunt, Liddy, McCord, and Gregory met at a Washington hotel to discuss breaking into McGovern headquarters to copy documents and to go over a physical layout of offices and the location of alarm systems. By early June, Gregory had serious questions about the propriety of his activities, which he discussed with his uncle, Robert Bennett. On or about June 15th or 16th, 1972, Gregory met with Hunt to tell him that he no longer wished to continue with his work. After terminating his employment with Hunt, Gregory also contacted the McGovern headquarters to discontinue his volunteer work. Gregory received approximately $3,400 for his services. End of section 18. Section 19 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1. E. Colson Suggestions Roger Stone Bart Porter recalled that Colson wanted to send someone to New Hampshire to make a contribution to the campaign of Rep. Pete McCluskey on behalf of some radical group. Porter testified that he gave Roger Stone $200 to travel to New Hampshire to make a cast contribution to the McCluskey campaign. Jeb Magruder stated that on one occasion, Charles Colson suggested that CRP send an individual wearing a gay lib button to a McGovern meeting. Roger Stone recalled that Porter suggested that he travel to New Hampshire and contribute money to McCluskey from the Gay Liberation Front. Stone said he persuaded Porter to make the contribution instead from the Young Socialist Alliance. A few days later, Porter called Stone back to his office and gave him $200 in cash for travel and a $135 contribution. Stone said he converted the $135 into small bills and coins to convey the image of a donation from many small contributors. Stone said he went to New Hampshire and delivered the contribution to a McCluskey campaign worker in a storefront. Stone received a receipt for the contribution from the campaign worker showing the source of the contribution as the Young Socialist Alliance. After he returned to Washington, Stone said he met with Porter and they drafted an anonymous letter to the Manchester Union leader and enclosed a photocopy of the receipt. The bogus contribution was staged and subsequently attempted to be leaked to discredit the McCluskey campaign with the New Hampshire voters. Theodore Brill Jeb Magruder testified that another incident initiated by Charles Colson was the infiltration of the peace vigil conducted by a group of Quakers in front of the White House. The group of Quakers gathered daily in front of the White House to protest the administration's Vietnam policy. Magruder said Colson told him that there should be someone finding out what the peace groups in front of the White House were doing. Magruder asked Ken Reitz, head of the Young Voters for the President, to find someone to get Colson the information. Reitz, whose experience in intelligence gathering began with the placement of Ruby I, delegated the assignment to his assistant, George Gorton. Gorton contacted Roger Stone and asked Stone if he knew a local young Republican who needed a summer job. Stone suggested Ted Brill, a former chairman of George Washington University's Young Republican Organization. Gorton asked Brill to come to CRP headquarters where he told him that the job consisted of infiltrating and monitoring the Quaker vigil as a first assignment. Brill's assignment was to determine the future intentions of this group, particularly its plans for the Republican convention in Miami. Brill periodically visited the vigil, sometimes wearing a McGovern campaign button, and talked with the protesters during the next six weeks. He reported verbally to Gordon six or seven times and received about $675 for his efforts. Brill was terminated the week following the Watergate break-in. Throughout the Gordon-Brill contacts, the possibility of further assignments was discussed, including infiltrating dissident groups at the Republican convention. Brill testified that after the news of the Watergate break-in, he received no further assignments. Magruder stated that the information from Brill went back to Ken Reitz and then to Richard Howard in Colson's office. F. Chapman's Friend Chapman's Friend was a code used by two reporters who were hired by Murray Chotner, a veteran of many Nixon campaigns, to travel with opposition campaigns posing as newspaper reporters and to monitor the activities of these opposition candidates during the 1972 campaign. Chotner said the operation was approved by John Mitchell, but was handled directly by Chotner. The first Chapman's friend, Seymour K. Fryden, worked from March to November 1971, and from May until the end of August 1972, covering as many candidates as possible. Fryden was not reporting for any newspaper at the time, and received his sole source of income from Chotner. Chutner said he told Fryden to observe everything he could while traveling with various campaigns and to report the information back to Chutner. Fryden identified himself as a working journalist to gain access to the Democratic campaigns. He phoned his reports to Chutner or Chutner's secretary. The reports discussed crowd reactions, interviews with staff people, and events that occurred both privately and publicly while on the campaign trail. The reports were typed in draft form by Chutner's secretary and edited by Chutner, whose final versions were sent to Haldeman and Mitchell. Once the Chapman's Friend report reached Haldeman, it was again copied and sent to members of Haldeman's staff. 
There was no indication on the Chapman's Friend report where the information came from or who was responsible for providing it. The reports were simply labeled Chapman's Friend Reports. Sometime in August 1973, Friedan got another assignment as a reporter and terminated his employment with Chotner. Chotner then hired Lucy Ann C. Goldberg. Mrs. Goldberg traveled with the campaign of Senator McGovern and also used the code name of Chapman's Friend. Mrs. Goldberg was employed by Chotner from September 1972 through the election in November. Both Goldberg and Fryden were paid $1,000 per week plus expenses with checks drawn from Chotner's law office account. Chotner's secretary submitted expense vouchers to FCRP for reimbursement of Chotner's expenses. On the vouchers, the payee's salary was shown only as reimbursements for survey, and related expenses were shown only as reimbursement for survey expenses. The only people who knew the true purpose of the survey expenditures, according to Chotner, were Mitchell, Magruder, and Robert Odell. Chotner told Odell the purpose of the payments, but refused to reveal the identities of the Chapman's friends because he did not want the name of the informant disclosed before the election. Odell, however, denied any knowledge of the purpose of the expenditures made by Chotner until sometime in June 1973, when he was informed of the purpose during questioning by the FBI. Odell wrote a memorandum on September 8, 1972, to Nick Bungato, a driver at CRP, which stated, once or twice a day, you will get a call from Mr. Chotner's office in the Reeves and Harrison law firm on the fifth floor of 1701, asking you to deliver envelopes directly to Mr. Haldeman's office on the first floor of the West Wing at the White House. Please give these requests top priority since the envelopes are very important and time will always be a factor. G. Young Voters for the President Demonstrations the CRP's efforts to counter or neutralize the traditionally Democratic youth vote were coordinated by the Young Voters for the President, YVP. Memorandums indicate that Ken Reitz, head of YVP, was directed by Jeb Magruder to organize demonstrations against the McGovern-Shriver campaign with the advice of Ed Feiler, special assistant at CRP. Rallies organized in the spring of 1972 were initially in support of the President's announcement on May 8, 1972, of the mining of Haiphong Harbor. Reitz organized a pro-Nixon vigil at the White House and organized pro-RN demonstrations were needed. After Senator McGovern was nominated at the Democratic Convention, Magruder directed Ed Failer to take responsibility for setting up McGovern-Shriver confrontations. Ken Reitz reported to Failer weekly on the success of the YVP in organizing demonstrations against the president. Failer himself reported to Magruder about his own efforts to disrupt the McGovern campaign. I have personally endeavored to create an encounter between Shriver and a busing opponent on the busing issue for today in Las Vegas. Anti-busing people will be used in this encounter, and no Republicans will be surfaced. In Reitz's report on the activities of the week of September 22, 1972, he cited daily orchestrated demonstrations by young voters for the president at McGovern and Shriver campaign stops. Reitz explained that good media coverage resulted from these efforts. Reporter Bruce Morton concluded that it was not a very good stop for McGovern. We are told an AP Wire story reported the presence of young Nixon supporters. Reitz also reported that the demonstrations upset candidate McGovern in Milwaukee. Finally, these demonstrations apparently forced cancellation of some of McGovern's planned activities. Failer wrote to Magruder, We have learned the McGovern organization and or the Secret Service has reacted to our activities. The San Gennaro Festival in Greenwich Village, New York, Saturday night, was originally planned as a walking tour of a few blocks by McGovern. However, as a result of the events in Flushing, New York on Thursday, September 21st, organized by YVP, the street walk was canceled and McGovern spoke in an area that was barricaded off. H. Use of Advanced People On July 28, 1971, Pat Buchanan wrote a memorandum to Attorney General Mitchell, which suggested the following activity for the 1972 campaign. Special Projects We would like to utilize John Walker's resources where possible to handle some close-in operations, pickets and the like, when candidates visit various cities. The candidate normally brings with him his own media, he attracts local media, and we would like to be able to piggyback on that media with our own operations and a candidate. This requires support activities from some source. Ron has an operation in place, and they will need approval, either general or specific, for these covert operations. 
Ron Walker headed the White House advancemen who were used to set up the logistics for the presidential visits. Thus, Buchanan suggested that they be used for anti-candidate, covert operations against the Democratic candidates. Buchanan testified that this idea was rejected. However, Ron Walker testified about other questionable tactics sometimes used by advancemen to counteract protesting signs at presidential appearances. Walker said that groups with pro-Nixon signs on sheets would be organized by advancemen prior to the appearance. At the first sign of any protest, the group would be moved to a curbside to place their signs between the president's motorcade and the protesting observers. Walker also testified that it was the advance operations policy to ensure that undesirables did not show up at presidential rallies. One technique used to keep out undesirables was the fake ticket routine, in which the advance men would ask for the ticket of an individual and then declare it a fake and escort the individual from the rally. Walker said this technique was used in Charlotte, North Carolina on Billy Graham Day to cope with potential protesters who were planning to show up for the president's appearance. Walker also stated that there were other recommendations for coping with demonstrators. One idea that was discussed was that the advance operation should have ready a pickup truck with cowboys in it, and if there was any trouble at an appearance, they would release the cowboys and let things happen. Walter said he recalled Haldeman discussing such tactics, but that such tactics were never implemented. I. Vote Siphoning Schemes Vote siphoning is essentially a direct interference by one political party or campaign in the affairs of another party or campaign for the purpose of weakening or eliminating an opposition candidate. In 1972, the Committee to Re-elect the President, CRP, secretly financed efforts to take votes away from Senator Muskie in the New Hampshire and Illinois primaries, and secretly supported an effort in California to drive the registration of the American Independent Party, AIP, below the required minimum so that AIP would not qualify for a spot on the ballot in the general election. The New Hampshire Primary The effort to take votes away from Senator Muskie in New Hampshire was initiated by Charles Coulson, according to Magruder, who told him that the project had been approved by both Haldeman and the president. Magruder cleared the project, at a cost of $8,000 to $10,000, with John Mitchell and also spoke to Haldeman about it. Colson, or someone in his office, according to Magruder, drafted a letter supporting a write-in campaign for Senator Kennedy, whose name was not on the ballot. The draft was taken by someone in Colson's office to Robin Ficker, a Democratic politician in Montgomery County, Maryland, who had been running a Kennedy for President headquarters since July 1971. Ficker said that in February 1972, someone who identified himself in a telephone conversation as Mike Abramson, asked him to sign a letter calling for a Kennedy write-in campaign. The letter was brought to Ficker's home by a Bill Robinson, who said he was with a law firm in Washington, D.C. Ficker signed the letter because he agreed with its contents. He was later told that between 150,000 and 180,000 copies of the letter were mailed to New Hampshire residents whose names appeared on the CRP mailing list of Democrats. Ficker also went to New Hampshire shortly before the primary and campaigned for Kennedy for four or five days. At Abramson's suggestion, he placed one advertisement in the Manchester Union Leader, credited to the United Democrats for Kennedy, which he signed and paid for himself. Ficker never saw Mike Abramson and never knew where he could be reached. Ficker believed that he worked with Kennedy aides in coordinating the Kennedy write-in campaign in New Hampshire. The write-in campaign for Senator Kennedy was totally financed by the committee to re-elect the president, yet that information was disclosed neither to Mr. Ficker or to the public during the campaign. Patrick Buchanan testified that, although not acquainted with the Ficker letter, he knew about Ficker's write-in campaign. Asked about the propriety of the letter, Buchanan responded that it was a borderline case with regard to unethical campaign practices. Buchanan had advocated a form of vote siphoning in an October 5, 1971 memorandum to Mitchell and Haldeman. 3. Fourth Party Candidacies Top-level consideration should be given to ways and means to promote, assist, and fund a fourth-party candidacy to the left Democrats and or the black Democrats. There is nothing that can so advance the president's chances for re-election, not a trip to China, not 4.5% employment, as a realistic black presidential campaign. The absence of a requirement that the true sponsors of such efforts to aid opposition party candidates be disclosed may mislead the public into thinking that there is more support for such candidates than in fact there is. 
The Illinois Primary The Committee to Re Elect the President apparently also directed some money to the Illinois primary campaign of Senator Eugene McCarthy, hoping that McCarthy would take votes away from the other candidate on the ballot, Senator Muskie. Once again, financial support of an opponent of Senator Muskie was not disclosed to the public. American Independent Party Effort in California The American Independent Party, AIP, was founded by supporters of George Wallace's presidential aspirations. The attempted vote siphoning aimed at AIP was limited in scope and unsuccessful, but it nonetheless provides an insight into the tactics supported by CRP to assure President Nixon's re-election. Under California law, a political party, as of January 1st of an election year, must have registered voters exceeding one-fifteenth of one percent of the total voter registration in the state to qualify for the ballot in a primary election. The plan was to convince enough of the approximately 140,000 registered AIP voters to re-register in another party before January 1, 1972, to drop AIP registration below the one-fifteenth of one percent figure. The re-registration plan was conceived in early 1971 by Robert J. Walters, a California businessman and sometime Wallace supporter who had become disenfranchised with the AIP after the 1968 presidential election. Walters was upset because the AIP was drawing votes away from conservative candidates of the two major parties. It was Walters' understanding that voters who had changed addresses since the 1970 election without notifying county authorities could be purged from the list of registered voters if proof of the address changes were presented to the officials. Walters planned to send a mass mailing to registered AIP voters, receive from the post office those letters undeliverable because of address changes, and then forward them to county election officials for purging. Walters also planned to enlist a large group of people who would personally contact AIP voters and urge them to re-register. Walters mailed re-registration literature under the heading of the Committee Against Forced Busing, urging AIP members to fight against busing by joining one of the major parties. In the summer of 1971, Walters began writing letters to numerous conservative groups asking for support. Walters also wrote a letter to CRP in Washington. In late September 1971, an unidentified man called Walters from New York City, said he worked for a group doing public relations work for President Nixon's re-election effort, and told Walters that he would be contacted by someone else regarding the re-registration drive. About mid-September, according to Walters, a man called him from a Los Angeles hotel and identified himself as Mr. Magruder from out of town. He said that he and Jeb Magruder met and discussed Walters' re-registration plan. Magruder remembered meeting with Walters and discussing the plan. While Walters waited for a follow-up call to the meeting with Magruder, an initial mailing went out, largely funded by Willis Carto of the Liberty Lobby. About October 1st, Walters hired a friend, Glenn Parker, to assist in the drive. In the meantime, Magruder received John Mitchell's approval for spending $10,000 and discussed the plan with Lynn Nofseeger, a Californian with many years of political experience who was then at the RNC. Nofseeger called Jack Lindsay, a Los Angeles businessman whom he knew. Nofseeger mentioned Walter's plan to Lindsay, and Lindsay agreed to monitor the project and pay the expenses. Nofseeger then arranged to send Lindsay $10,000 in cash that he obtained from Hugh Sloan. Lindsay called Walters to arrange a meeting to discuss funding without indicating the source of the money. Walters briefed Lindsay on the results of the mass mailing and door-to-door -door visits during several occasions in the late fall of 1971. Lindsay forwarded Walters' written reports on the drive to Nofziger, who said he mailed them to Magruder without reading them. Lindsay paid Walters' expenses plus $150 per week salary. After the re-registration drive folded in late 1971, Lindsay still held $1,000 of the $10,000, which he said he donated in his name to a Los Angeles fundraising dinner for President Nixon. The re-registration effort itself never got off the ground despite the $10,000 CRP contribution. Many county officials refused to purge voters who had moved. In addition, the personal canvassing effort faltered from the beginning and ended up involving members of the American Nazi Party. Walters was never able to recruit volunteers or paid canvassers in numbers sufficient to ensure more than a minimal canvassing effort. His assistant, Glenn Parker, knew that Joseph Tomasi, then head of the regional Nazi party, needed money for mortgage payments on the party headquarters. Parker hired Tomasi and some of his associates who contacted AIP members on the re-registration drive 
without identifying themselves as Nazi Party members. Documents show that Tomasi received some $1,200 of money originally from CRP for his efforts. The re-registration drive was a complete failure, according to all participants. J. Unsigned Literature In addition to the incidents cited above of unsigned literature printed and distributed by CRP agents prior to the break-in at the DNC, there was a suggestion made by the White House after the break-in that unidentified literature should be prepared and distributed by the CRP. Richard Howard, Charles Colson's administrative assistant, wrote in a memo to Ed Failer on June 28, 1972. An idea that has come from very high sources is that a booklet or small brochure be prepared, with no identification as to who prepared it, on the McGovern platform. All the issues should be listed, such as labor, national defense, amnesty, pot, poverty, abortion, etc. Under each issue should be the worst possible quote, statement, or reported position by McGovern regarding the issue. Some of his bland or non-controversial issues should also be included. After the booklet is completed, a large distribution should be made to opinion leaders. There is presently no evidence before the committee to indicate whether this suggestion was implemented. 3. Impact on Democratic Campaigns It is difficult, if not impossible, to assess accurately the impact of the activities described above on the 1972 presidential campaign. Donald Segretti testified that one of the tactical objectives outlined for him by Dwight Chapin was to foster a split between the Democratic hopefuls. In addition, much of the other disruptive activity described above appears to have been intended to divide the Democrats, in the words of Pat Buchanan. Both Burl Bernhard, Senator Muskie's campaign manager, and Frank Mankiewicz, Senator McGovern's campaign director, testified that the activities described above were successful in dividing the Democratic candidates among themselves. Bernhard testified that the dirty tricks emanating from the White House and CRP generated suspicion and animosity between the staffs of the Democratic contenders. Mankiewicz testified that the objective of the dirty tricks was to create within the Democratic Party such a strong sense of resentment among the candidates and their followers as to make unity of the party impossible once a nominee was selected. At that, the efforts seemed to have been most successful. Though no witness could testify that the outcome of the general election would have been any different if the dirty tricks discussed above had not occurred, these activities helped to leave the Democratic Party bitterly divided at the close of the presidential primaries. Frank Mankiewicz noted that what was created by the sabotage effort was an unparalleled atmosphere of rancor and discord within the Democratic Party. Senator Muskie was widely acknowledged throughout 1971 as the Democratic frontrunner and most formidable political opponent for President Nixon. As Patrick Buchanan wrote Attorney General Mitchell on July 28, 1971, the clear and present danger is that Senator Muskie, the favorite in the early primaries, will promenade through the primaries, come into the convention with a clear majority and enormous momentum for November. That would be bad news for us. As a result of this concern, almost all of the activities described above, Segretti and Agents, Ruby 1, Ruby 2, Sedan Chair, Sedan Chair 2, and others, initially focused their attention on Senator Muskie. After the early primary, Senator Muskie's campaign declined, and he withdrew from active campaigning following the Pennsylvania primary. On April 12, 1972, Buchanan and Kachigian wrote to Haldeman and Mitchell, Our primary objective, to prevent Senator Muskie from sweeping the early primaries, locking up the convention in April, and uniting the Democratic Party behind him for the fall, has been achieved. Earl Bernhard testified that Senator Muskie's decline was attributable to a lack of adequate financing, a proliferation of Democratic primaries, the polarization of the Democratic Party, and the problems of a centrist candidate. However, Bernhard also testified that the dirty tricks took a toll in the form of diverting our resources, changing our schedule, altering our political approaches, and being thrown on the defensive. Finally, both Mankiewicz and Bernard testified that the activities described above were not politics as usual for either Democrats or Republicans. Apart from the activities noted above that were directly linked to President Nixon's re-election campaign, the campaigns of Democratic contenders encountered many other instances of disruptive or deceptive behavior. For example, the well-known Canuck letter was published by the Manchester Union leader on February 24, 1972, less than two weeks before the New Hampshire primary. The letter, allegedly from a Paul Morrison of Deerfield Beach, Florida, 
claimed that Senator Muskie had laughed at an aide's use of the racist slur Knuck. Senator Muskie issued an absolute denial of the charges on a flatbed truck outside the offices of the union leader and denounced its editor, William Loeb. The committee was unable to discover the individuals responsible for this dirty trick. Senator Muskie also responded emotionally to an article about his wife reprinted in the Union Leader, which was subsequently reported by the media as the Muskie crying incident. The other instances or allegations of improper activities directed at Democratic candidates that were not linked to any other presidential campaign are contained in the committee files that are not detailed in this report. End of section 19. Section 20 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1. C. Improper Activities Directed Against President Nixon's Re-Election Campaign. Testimony before the committee indicates that the 1972 re-election campaign of President Nixon was subjected to some improper, unethical, or illegal activities perpetrated by persons individually or in combination with others. Some of these activities took the form of violent acts of destruction against local campaign offices. The select committee condemns all acts of violence by individuals against the campaign of any political candidate. Other improper activities directed at President Nixon's campaign included demonstrations which may have prevented citizens from exercising their rights to assemble freely, and a few examples of scurrilous literature directed against President Nixon. It should also be noted that except for a few isolated examples noted below, there is presently no evidence indicating that these improper activities were directly or indirectly related to the campaign of any Democratic candidate. 1. Demonstrations Affidavits in the committee record describe in detail some of the violent demonstrations directed against the Nixon re-election campaign. The most significant of these demonstrations are described below. In Boston, a demonstration at an appearance of Mrs. Nixon resulted in some personal injuries to bystanders and extensive property damage, e.g. smashing of windshields, the slashing of tires, and the burning of an automobile. The Nixon campaign car suffered much damage, and expletive-deleted Nixon was scratched in the paint all over the car. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, demonstrators chanted slogans during a campaign speech by President Nixon in an attempt to disrupt the president's rally. Testimony from the Tulsa CRP Youth Coordinator alleged that the demonstration had been organized by the local McGovern Campaign College Coordinator. The committee also received testimony that demonstrators in Fresno, California, some of whom carried McGovern campaign signs, shouted down potential Republican speakers with obscenities and abusive language. In Tampa, Florida, testimony indicates that a group of demonstrators shouted in unison and heckled a speech by then-Vice President Agnew. In Chicago, Illinois, Agnew's appearance was continually disturbed by large groups of unruly demonstrators. An appearance by President Nixon in Atlanta, Georgia, provoked a demonstration by about 75 individuals. The demonstrators apparently engaged in shouting obscenities and their pushing and shoving caused some observers to be concerned for the president's safety. In Maine, the campaign appearance of then-Vice President Agnew was met by a large crowd of demonstrators protesting against the war. There was testimony before the committee that some individuals threw cans and plastic bags filled with tomato juice at Republican delegates and at Vice President Agnew. In New York City, the Nixon re-election campaign offices were harassed by demonstrators who dumped cockroaches in the offices and threw paint on volunteer Nixon workers at a storefront. In Columbus, Ohio, an appearance by then-Vice President Agnew was met by a large demonstration in which demonstrators threw rocks and other objects at both guests and police one of which struck Agnew's car's window directly behind where the vice president was seated. The committee also received testimony indicating that high-level McGovern campaign personnel participated in the organization of a demonstration at the campaign appearance of President Nixon at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles on September 27, 1972. Fred Totter, the Southern California campaign coordinator for McGovern, testified that at a meeting between himself, Rick Stearns, the McGovern Western Campaign Coordinator, and two other McGovern workers, 
it was decided that the McGovern phone banks in the Los Angeles headquarters would be available to the sponsors of the demonstration in order to call individuals to encourage them to attend the demonstrations. Stearns testified that he was aware of planning for the demonstration and that he had no objections to McGovern staffers attending the demonstration, but that he recalled no requests to the campaign to provide any assistance for the demonstration. Tauter testified that the McGovern phone banks were used on two successive nights by demonstration organizers, and that leaflets announcing the demonstration were distributed in about half of the McGovern storefronts in the Los Angeles area. Use of the phone banks was terminated, Tauter testified, because they were needed to organize a rally for Senator McGovern the following week. In response to inquiries from the press about the use of the phone banks, McGovern press spokesman Fred Epstein told reporters, I don't know who allowed them to use the phones or who told them to stop. It probably was some overzealous person in the campaign. Tauter testified that the press statement left the wrong impression. About 3,000 individuals demonstrated against President Nixon at Century Plaza, but the demonstration was peaceful by all accounts. The use of the resources of a political campaign, however, to organize a large demonstration against an opponent raises questions of propriety. H.R. Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, and Rob Odell all testified that the frequency and intensity of demonstrations in the 1972 campaign were a cause of major concern both within the White House and within the Committee to Re-elect the President. Finally, the Committee received both testimony and extensive documentation describing some of the violent demonstrations which occurred in Miami Beach, Florida, during the Republican Convention Week, August 19th to August 24th, 1972. Congressman Tim Lee Carter testified before the committee and outlined some instances of physical violence to which he and his wife were subjected while attending the Republican convention. Congressman Carter also testified about a number of personal injuries and property damage that he observed while attending the Republican National Convention. The committee also received in evidence the chronological log of events prepared by the Miami Beach Police Department which recites the number of incidents of violence which were perpetrated on delegates and their families by demonstrators in Miami. These incidents included, for example, the pelting of delegates with eggs and rocks, slashing tires, attempts to set buses filled with delegates on fire, stuffing potatoes in exhaust pipes, smashing windows, throwing ignited paper mache bombs into the convention compound, tear grass grenades thrown by demonstrators, shots fired at police officers, and demonstrators marching on convention hall attired with helmets, gas masks, and nightsticks. As a result of these tactics, more than 1,200 arrests were made in two days during the convention week. A delegate from South Carolina described in a letter to the committee that the entire South Carolina delegation to the convention had stones thrown at them as they boarded their bus to proceed to the Miami Convention Hall on the last evening of the convention. In addition, the South Carolina delegate described the slashing of the bus's tires, the destruction of the gas lines of the bus by demonstrators, and the physical abuse to which the delegates were subjected. We were pushed and shoved, struck by eggs, stones, and fists, and spit on. We found ourselves separated into twos and threes. They tore clothing and screamed obscenities. The slogans many of them chanted called for either ending the war in Vietnam or dumping President Nixon. In the confusion, my wife and I were temporarily separated. I finally was able to rescue her from a doorway where she was trapped by the mob. Her dress had been torn, and she was hysterical. From the evidence in the committee's records, it appears that most of the demonstrators in Miami Beach during the Republican convention were part of demonstrations against the war. Any act of violence directed at participants in the political process has no place in the American political system. It should be noted here that the Select Committee received a letter on June 8, 1973 from John H. David, Chief of the Internal Security Section of the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice, which stated that neither the ISD files nor the Federal Bureau of Investigation had any information which linked any Democratic candidate in the 1972 campaign to any criminal acts or any conspiracies to commit unlawful or disruptive acts. 2. Campaign Violence and Harassment Another problem in the 1972 presidential campaign was the violence directed against CRP and Republican campaign offices in various cities. In Phoenix, Arizona, the CRP headquarters building was gutted by fire resulting from arsonists splashing some five gallons of gasoline throughout the headquarters. The affidavit of George Williford Jr. described a fire set in the state Republican headquarters offices in Austin, Texas in the spring of 1972. 
Other affidavits described attempted arson against CRP headquarters in Albuquerque and New Hampshire. Further affidavits described gunshots being fired into campaign headquarters of the CRP in Massachusetts and in Pennsylvania. In Springfield, Massachusetts, the room into which the shot was fired was full of people, but no one was injured. Other acts of destruction directed against the 1972 campaign to re-elect President Nixon included the smashing of plate glass windows, the spraying of vulgar anti-Nixon signs on buildings and windows, and alleged break-ins to the campaign headquarters where campaign property was destroyed. President Nixon's re-election campaign was also subjected to some improper and distasteful literature. For example, pamphlets and brochures appeared in the campaign which ranged from cartoons depicting President Nixon with fangs dropping bombs on people to posters with crude sexual puns. Other examples of literature directed against the president's campaign efforts, usually by anti-war groups, may be found in the committee record. A piece of inappropriate campaign literature which bears mention was the unimaginative piece distributed in California which said, Nixon is trafe, and which went on to state, Thanks to modern technology, Nixon brings the ovens to the people rather than the people to the ovens. In addition, Michael Heller testified that he observed this pamphlet both in the McGovern Fairfax headquarters in Los Angeles in September 1972, as well as being distributed in the streets by McGovern campaign workers. Paul Brinsey, head of the three West Side Los Angeles offices for McGovern, testified that he directed a young volunteer in the McGovern offices to mimeograph off 3,000 copies of the pamphlet, Nixon is Trafe. Burns also testified that at the suggestion of the Southern California McGovern coordinator, the McGovern campaign decided to place the blame for the distribution of this pamphlet on the 16-year volunteer who had merely mimeographed the pamphlet at the direction of campaign superiors. As a result, the 16-year-old volunteer was terminated, and Paul Brinsey remained in his capacity as the director of one of the McGovern campaign in Los Angeles offices. 3. Recommendations the recommendations which follow are an effort by the Select Committee to help prevent the recurrence of improper, unethical, and illegal activities that took place in the 1972 campaign. Of central importance to these recommendations is the creation of an independent Federal Elections Commission, similar to the proposal in S-3044, already passed by the Senate, with full enforcement and subpoena powers to monitor and enforce the election laws. This proposal is discussed more fully elsewhere in this report. 1. The committee recommends that Congress enact criminal legislation to prohibit anyone from obtaining employment, voluntary or paid, in a campaign of an individual seeking nomination or election to any federal office by false pretenses, misrepresentations, or other fraudulent means for the purpose of interfering with, spying on, or obstructing any campaign activities of such candidate. Furthermore, such legislation should make it unlawful for anyone to direct, instruct, or pay anyone to join any such campaign by such means or for such purposes as are outlined above. Discussion New legislation is needed to prevent the infiltration of presidential and federal campaigns. The activities of Donald Segretti, Robert Benz, Michael McMinoway, Elmer Wyatt, Tom Gregory, and others are abundant documentation of the numerous infiltration efforts in the 1972 campaign. The dangers of this infiltration range from the confusion and suspicion resulting from leaked information to the opponents, or newspapers, to more systematic disruption and sabotage of the opposition campaign. Infiltration occurred in the 1972 campaign, which ranged from placing a false name on a mailing list of the Democratic National Party, to the systematic infiltration of Michael McMinoway in the various Democratic Party campaigns. It is essential for a campaign or organization to have free and open discussion, without fear that one of the oversants is a spy from the opposition. Every campaign requires some maintenance of confidentiality. Sensitive matters must be examined. Personalities discussed, and confidential policy must be deliberated. One of the purposes of the legislation outlined above is to free political campaigns from infiltrators who report systematically back to the opposition campaign. The proposed legislation would not ban a Chapman's friend or a reporting arrangement where the reporter does not actually join another campaign. While this practice may not be ethically pure, this legislation is aimed at ridding campaigns of the unhealthy deception of actual infiltrators. Where the individual does not actually work himself into the confidences of an alien campaign, the potential harm to the campaign is diminished even though deception still exists. 2. The committee recommends that Congress enact legislation to make it unlawful to request or knowingly to disperse or make available campaign funds 
for the purpose of promoting or financing violations of federal election laws. This recommendation is an effort to deter individuals with control over campaign funds from blindly and automatically providing money for campaign activities whenever they are so instructed. For example, Herb Kambach, the custodian of leftover 1968 campaign funds, funded Tony Ulasowicz's campaign activities for nearly three years as well as the travels and illegal activities of Donald Segretti. A statute such as the one outlined above would force people with control over campaign funds to inquire more fully about the expenditures that were requested since they would be held criminally liable for funds spent for illegal purposes. In addition, this recommendation seeks to deter individuals working in political campaigns from requesting campaign funds in order to promote illegal activities during federal campaigns. Such a statute, as is recommended above, would be an effective deterrent to many activities like those occurring in the 1972 campaign. 3. The committee recommends that Congress enact new legislation which prohibits the theft, unauthorized copying, or the taking by false pretenses of campaign materials, documents, or papers not available for public dissemination belonging to or in the custody of a candidate for federal office or his aides. Discussion The evidence of Donald Segretti, Robert Benz, Doug Kelly, Jack Buckley, Elmer Wyatt, Michael McMinoway, Tom Gregory, and Howard Hunt clearly established the need for a larceny statute, which can be used to prevent such unauthorized takings in a federal election. Present larceny by false pretense statutes in most states require the object that is taken to be a thing of value, since papers are generally not thought to have value in the sense that the term is used in the existing statute, a new federal election larceny statute is necessary to prosecute such violations. 4. The committee recommends that Congress should make it unlawful for any individual to fraudulently misrepresent by telephone or in person that he is representing a candidate for federal office for the purpose of interfering with the election. Present federal criminal legislation, 18 U.S.C. Section 612, requires that campaign literature disclose the names of individuals and organizations responsible for its publication and distribution. However, there are numerous cases of false, deceptive, and misleading literature published elsewhere and distributed in the 1972 campaign by fraudulent or non-existent sponsors. The existence of this literature in the 1972 campaign demonstrates the need for better publication and more rigorous enforcement of the existing federal law in this area. The proposed new independent Federal Elections Commission would be the appropriate institution to accomplish these objectives of better publicity and more rigorous enforcement. It is important to eliminate this form of deception from federal campaigns since voters have the right to know whether the pamphlet they receive, the advertisement they read, or the expression of support they observe represent the bona fide views of his fellow citizens. Manipulation of voters' views through misrepresentation has no place in the democratic process. Similarly, late-night calls to voters of a state from a non-existent group purporting to support a particular candidate also have no place in the electoral process. Thus, the recommendation seeks to deter other kinds of misrepresentation in political campaigns not presently covered by existing legislation. Fraudulent door-to-door -door canvassing and fraudulent phone calls to voters on behalf of a candidate are the kinds of misrepresentation that have no place in federal campaigns. This recommendation is an effort to help deter such behavior. Summary the improper and unethical activities that occurred in the 1972 campaign will not be eliminated merely by new legislation. Although law seeks both to shape and reflect the moral and ethical values of individuals, new laws cannot fully substitute for such individual values. Therefore, the political process and government itself must attract individuals of the highest moral and ethical standards if the improper activities that occurred in the 1972 presidential campaign are to be eliminated completely in the future. End of section 20. Read by Eric Bjornsson. Section 21 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1, Chapter 3, Use of the Incumbency, 
Responsiveness Program, Part 1 Introduction and Overview A significant aspect of the Select Committee's investigation was its inquiry into the administration's programs to use the powers of incumbency to re-elect the President. Documents obtained by the Committee indicate that this effort, which had as its main vehicle a White House-devised plan known as the Responsiveness Program, was an organized endeavor to politicize the executive branch to ensure that the administration remained in power. The scope of this effort was broad and its potential impact considerable. It included, for example, plans to redirect federal monies to specific administration supporters and to target groups and geographic areas to benefit the campaign it entailed instructions to shape the legal and regulatory action to enhance campaign goals it comprised plans to utilize government employment procedures for election benefit not only were such plans laid they were in part consummated although departmental and agency resistance to campaign pressures limited the success of these endeavors particularly in regard to the expenditure of federal monies concerning certain minority and constituent groups were there flagrant abuses of proper governmental procedures some of these abuses appear to stem from the improper involvement of campaign officials in governmental decision-making several federal civil and criminal laws appear applicable to the conduct described in this chapter in fact a question exists whether the planning and implementation of the responsiveness plan rises to the level of a conspiracy to interfere with the lawful functioning of government conduct prosecutable under eighteen u s c three seventy one as a conspiracy to defraud the united states as that term has been interpreted by the supreme court the evidence presented below is not exhaustive while the staff has interviewed over one hundred and fifty witnesses and reviewed thousands of documents respecting these matters it has not been able because of time and staffing limitations comprehensively to cover all possible areas of investigation this is particularly the case since the responsiveness program was intended to pervade the entire executive branch including regional offices the select committee believes however that the account presented below is a fair and accurate statement of the parameters of the responsiveness program certain actions taken under its aegis and other related conduct it makes this assertion with confidence because much of the evidence obtained respecting these matters is documentary the account below consists largely of excerpts from the plethora of documents uncovered by staff investigators the principal documents are appended to this report as are certain relevant executive session transcripts the committee's report on these activities concludes with certain legislative recommendations designed to restrain future misuse of federal resources for political purposes two early manifestations of administration's interest in using the incumbency to affect the re-election effort Throughout 1971, members of the administration and the campaign team, which began to form in May 1971, displayed a studied interest in using the resources of the federal government to enhance the president's re-election chances. John Dean, testifying in executive session before the committee on June 16, 1973, expressed the concern relayed to him by H. R. Haldeman as to the activities of the White House staff. Quote, it was probably in summer of 1971, to the best of my recollection, that Mr. Haldeman began discussion with me what my office should and could be doing during the campaign. He told me that all the officers in the White House were having discussions and were being told the President's wish was to take maximum advantage of the incumbency and the White House would reshift itself from the current duties to focus very much on the re-election of the President. End quote. The statements of Mr. Haldeman and Ehrlichman during committee interviews on January 31, 1974, and February 8, 1974, respectively, also indicate that the President was interested in using the resources of the federal government to best advantage in the re-election campaign. 
the testimony of patrick buchanan discussed in chapter two of this report provides another account of the administration's early interest in utilizing the incumbency for campaign purposes this interest is revealed not only by testimony of witnesses before the committee but also in numerous documents prepared in nineteen seventy one a sampling of such documents follows one on january twelfth nineteen seventy one jeb magruder then a white house staffer submitted a confidential eyes only memorandum to attorney general mitchell regarding political activities in the white house in nineteen seventy the memorandum concluded with the following paragraph under the heading resource development Quote, our administration has not made effective political use of the resources of the federal government the rnc the white house and outside groups and corporations in developing the structure for the campaign proper use of these resources should be a primary concern at the outset of the planning End quote. two magruder apparently at the attorney general's request began an examination of the utilization of federal resources by others in the presidential campaigns on april fourteenth nineteen seventy one he wrote a confidential memorandum to dean which began quote, it has been requested that we determine what use presidents eisenhower and johnson and vice president humphrey made of resources available in the federal government for campaign purposes end quote. dean's assistance in this project was requested less than a month later on may sixth magruder reported his interim findings to mitchell in a confidential memorandum entitled utilization of government resources by general eisenhower president johnson and vice president humphrey his conclusion as to President Eisenhower's campaign was, quote, During the actual campaign, no use was made of the White House or the federal government to specifically work on the campaign other than the normal support activities given General Eisenhower through his position as president. Magruder, however, concluded that employment of federal resources by President Johnson and Vice President Humphrey was more extensive. Quote, under johnson it has been indicated that he made considerable use of the white house staff and individuals in the departments to work on the campaign at the present time i have not been able to get any specific information but hopefully will have more concise information in the near future before the convention humphrey used many people on his vice presidential staff as well as individuals who were employed by the cabinet committees he was in charge of to work specifically on the campaign many individuals remained on the government payroll after the convention and continued to work exclusively on the campaign as an example the individual who headed up his veterans activity was employed by the veterans administration and remained with the v a throughout the campaign some use was also made of the research facilities at the census bureau End quote. because this committee's mandate is limited to an examination of the nineteen seventy two campaign no effort has been made to substantiate or refute magruder's allegations magruder ended his memorandum to mitchell on a cautionary note quote, one reason why both johnson and humphrey had an easier time than we would have in this situation is that the control of congress was under the democrats and my information is that it was difficult for the republicans to make much of this issue on the hill on the other hand if we used these resources in the same way johnson and humphrey did with the control of congress in the hands of the democrats they could make this an issue from a public relations standpoint it would seem best to restrict the use of government employees to one direct assistance for the president and two to help develop strategy they should not get involved in the day-to-day -day campaign functions End quote. three magruder however on may seventeenth nineteen seventy one sent gordon strahan a white house staffer working for haldeman a confidential memorandum on political use of the white house computer 
and on june fourteenth nineteen seventy one he forwarded to william horton a june third nineteen seventy one confidential eyes only memorandum to magruder from william timmons of the white house staff which read quote, as you know preston martin is head of the federal home loan bank board he is a california nixon republican and is a little put out that nobody has sought his political advice apparently he has given a great deal of thought to and designed a sound economical plan to use federal resources projects contracts etc for advantage in nineteen seventy two he has graphs maps flowcharts etc to show how available money can be directed into the areas where it would do the most good very scientific i am told while i have not talked to preston i think it would be valuable for you to chat with him about his plan End quote. the memorandum to horton which was also designated confidential eyes only suggested that horton see martin and quote, plug this into your project End quote. the nature of mr horton's project is discussed in detail below item six this section mr martin has stated to the committee that he never devised a plan to use federal resources for political advantage and the committee has not uncovered additional evidence that establishes the contrary four the concern respecting use of federal resources to affect the election is reflected in communications among other white house and campaign staffers two confidential eyes only memorandums from peter millspa a white house political aide to harry dent to harry fleming of the campaign staff dated may twelfth and june twenty third nineteen seventy one are instructive the memorandums indicate that certain white house and departmental personnel were meeting to consider the use of government resources particularly government patronage in the campaign the may twelfth memorandum states quote, a consensus emerged that the range of federal resources must be inventoried and analyzed with perhaps the federal grants area broken out for priority treatment because of the immediate benefits and some budget cycle timing considerations additionally the matter of a delivery system which would put these resources at our disposal on a timely basis was considered to be imperative End quote attached to the june twenty third nineteen seventy one memorandum is a document listing the basic types of patronage that could be employed for campaign purposes this document is quoted in full text quote, the basic types of patronage one jobs full-time part-time retainers consultantships etc two revenue contracts federal government as purchaser gsa grants do good programs eda model cities nsf research etc subsidies needy industries airlines etc bank deposits all federal accounts social need programs direct benefit to citizen social security welfare etc public works projects three execution of federal law resides mainly in the department of justice whose interpretive power touches every vested interest four information and public relations capacity a professional question mark public relations office in each department and agency constitutes an enormous public information apparatus five travel domestic transportation can be provided by law foreign travel international conferences etc are available five a significant document that reflects administration interest in nineteen seventy one in employing federal resources is a june twenty third nineteen seventy one confidential discussion draft entitled communicating presidential involvement in federal government programs prepared by william horton of frederick malick's staff this document is also important because it appears a forerunner of the responsiveness program concept discussed in the next section of this chapter horton prepared this paper under the supervision of malick who had received a request from haldeman to consider how the grant-making process could be used to the president's advantage 
the memorandum's initial paragraph recommends that quote, the president's direct control over awarding selected grants should be strengthened to ensure that political circumstances can be considered if appropriate in making awards it then states to ensure politically sensitive grant applications receive appropriate consideration two basic steps must be carried out one determine which grants are politically sensitive and two ensure these grants receive positive consideration from o b m and the departments End quote. under the heading determination of politically sensitive grants horton wrote quote, this step should be accomplished in a manner which minimizes the risk of unfavorable publicity and falsely raised expectations therefore the possibilities of surveying all pending grant applications or soliciting the opinion of congressional and local nixon supporters were rejected identification should rely on routine contacts with various white house and campaign officials for example support of senators and congressmen usually inform the congressional relations staff of pending grants which are politically important to them state and local representatives contact various white house officials in a similar manner all these inputs should be passed along to gifford for consideration by the grant coordination group based on past experience the most politically important grant applications are usually brought to the attention of white house or campaign officials however especially important localities where no appropriate grants seem to be in process will be checked in the grant initiation process covered below this identification process will generate more grants than could be or should be given special consideration consequently priorities must be set End quote. The memorandum then sets forth a procedure to ensure that the most recent political information and campaign priorities are considered in selecting must grants. Under the heading Initiating Grants, Horton stated, quote, In addition to designing must grants from pending applications, there may be occasions in which political circumstances require a grant be generated for a locality once such a locality is identified by the campaign organization the coordinating group would decide what kind of grant would best meet the needs and available program resources a campaign representative would then inform the appropriate local official what to submit when submitted it of course would be designated a must gifford must rely on the departments to follow through on must grants under their jurisdiction to accomplish this a network of departmental coordinators should be established these individuals must have two prime qualities loyalty to the president and sufficient authority to ensure must grants are approved and departmental announcements of all grants conform to the guidelines discussed subsequently the memorandum continues gifford must be flexible on pushing a must grant in case it turns out to be substantially irresponsible or an obvious waste of government funds relative to other pending grants in such cases gifford should weigh the substantive drawbacks and risk of adverse publicity against the expected political benefits consulting with others as needed he should then make a final decision on whether the grant is to be approved also in order to minimize the risk of embarrassment to the president the volume of grants designated musts in any one department should be limited gifford should make these judgments on a month-to-month -month basis drawing naturally from the grant coordinating group and the departmental contacts End quote it may be a fair reading of the last quoted passage that mr horton is recommending that in some cases grants that are substantively irresponsible or an obvious waste of government funds relative to other pending grants should be made if the political reward is sufficiently great both mr horton and mr malek disagree with this interpretation see malek executive session april eighth nineteen seventy four the Horton Memorandum apparently was transmitted to Messrs. Mitchell, Haldeman, Magruder, Gifford, Millspa, and Fleming, among others. Malik has insisted that this document was nothing more than a discussion draft, as the first page of the document indicates, and was not acted upon as outlined here. 
malik does not recall that he criticized horton for the ideas therein presented he does not recall that disapproval of this document was expressed to him by its various recipients to the contrary the memorandums of transmittal for this document found at malik exhibit number eight generally indicate approval of and interest in the program horton advocated moreover as will become clear in the next section many of the specifics horton posited were incorporated into the responsiveness program a plan largely devised by horton under malik's direct supervision this ends section twenty one